Right. Uh, so yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, we will we'll 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 start in a second. Uh, so again, you know, I'm more than happy if you've got questions as we go through. Stick your hands up, put it in the chat, or if you well, uh, you know, it's a long time just for me to kind of go on at you. But um, if you don't, I will just uh, I will just talk. Okay. So 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 anyway, well, welcome to this this Foundation of Fluid talk. So I'm going to talk a bit about my research on air water flows and some of what my some of my PhD students have been doing in this in this area. Um, so basically, looking at why air water flows are important in various different types of hydraulic infrastructure. That could be anything from spillways to kind of flood alleviations to wastewater treatment plants. Um, they all tend to have the thing in common that there's water moving around and it gets aerated, but there also might be other things happening, a, a, chemi a biological process and things. So they, they tend to be quite complicated because of the combination of the free surface and then these other things happening. So you have to be cautious about how you do the modeling. But actually, if we can model these processes, then um, it's really helpful or really important. So. Um, I'm just making my slides work. So my, my research more generally is, so I'm very interested in processes which involve free surfaces. So example, a, a river or flow down a spillway, which we'll be talking a bit more about today. Um, but also problems where you've got flow coupled to another process. So that could be heat transfer. So for example, in um, uh, heat exchanges, even in aircraft and things like this, but also where you've got biological and chemical reactions. So um, happening or even where you've got this air entrainment, which I'll talk a bit more about right today. So basically today, going to look at modeling of some or examples of some modeling some air water flows for hydraulic infrastructure, looking at some of the challenges. Uh, we'll look at, um, well, quite a lot of that spill, spillways, both step spillways and non-step spillways, because they tend to be fairly vital hydraulic infrastructure, looking at some of the multi-phase models we can use, um, and then just some, some of the wider kind of uh, impacts. I'll also briefly talk about a PhD project with Mott McDonald at the end, which is one which should likely be getting offered as one of the um, projects this year. And just to kind of um, say that um, Jacob, Katerina, Andy, and James all, uh, um, well, Jacob and Katerina have all finished their PhDs, Andy and James still still working on theirs, but that I'm gonna talk about some of their research as we, as we go through as well. Right, so um, spillways, just to give you a little bit of context. So I'm sure you all know what a spillway is, but they are the thing which allows us to control the flow from a res reservoir out. So they, they're used to dissipate energy um, and um, safely um, uh, re remove water from one place to the other. But they're critical because obviously you've got a big reservoir behind, that's a lot of water. If the dam fails, which the, which is um, linked to the spillway, you've got big problems. And with the larger weather, weather events we're seeing all across UK, but actually Europe and wider, all the spillways are being re-evaluated to see if they've got the capacities to actually um, extract the water without safely. And it's been shown lots of them need to be uh, made bigger or updated or or, or kind of things. Um, so that's a, so that's very costly, but also you need processes to design them. And we'll talk a bit about it. So traditionally it would have been designed with physical scale models, but more and more uh, computational models are, well, are being used in part, but they'd like to use them more. Uh, so we'll just have a look at this. This is actually Busley, which is in, uh, near Marsden, so not far away, and you can see they've replaced it actually with a concrete spillway. So they've taken up all the old masonry blocks, um, replaced it with concrete, but they have clad it all in stone because these tend to be uh, fairly um, elegant looking structures. And if people just replace them with concrete, people get a bit annoyed because they were actually quite nice things. So it's actually quite sensitive replacing a spillway just in terms of, you know, it's, a, it's almost like a piece of architecture. Uh, and we've got more serious cases of failures to spill away. So you probably remember the Oroville Dam incident in 2017. This is where you had this massive spillway. So not a step spillway, just a smooth spillway. And it had a fracture part way down. Um, and they then went to the secondary spillway, which I'll show you in a second, which is over here, which then they realized hadn't been used very much. Um, and then they were worried that was going to fail as well. And, and they needed to get the water out. And if that had gone, that would have been cataclysmic event I think so it's so you know the spillways are really important for that they need to work so this is that what this is the Oroville one so it basically failed here and you can see this is where it was it undercut some of the some of the um, surface of the spillway came out and then that undercut very quickly so they had to then move to the secondary spillway which you can sort of see over here um, and but they realized that was maybe not going to be able to take the flow as well and they then had to try and um, pump water out quickly so, uh, typical my videos let me just try that this video again to see if i can make it work 
seems to be a bit sensitive whether it, I'm just going to go back a slide. There we go. So just to give you a quick look at that. Uh, so the actual main spillway, which is this one, is over to the right. So, this, so the one you can see here is the secondary one, and you can see it starting to flow down, um, and then that that was that was becoming problematic. So um, yeah, a big a big incident, and just highlighting why they're important. So now we get and it gets also just see the sorts of flow you tend to get characteristic i'll talk a bit about this characters flow nice laminar flow over the top then you'll start getting an inception point then you get white water starting to be uh, drawn into the flow that's that's characteristic of all all spillways okay okay so yeah just so basically uh, um obviously these dams do fail sometimes and this is a this is one from 1975 so this is the Bangkok uh, dam in china now it's not wasn't that well publicized it was in a fairly remote place in in china but it was a, a massive dam failure you know some predictions around maybe a quarter of a million people may have died in it um but when these things go it's obviously a really significant event so the the spillways are the things which tend to be really important for to preventing that okay and then we have issues close to home so t summer 2019 we had the Tobbrook reservoir and uh, near welly bridge and in this case we had this sort of failure um it's still been investigating accident what what the actual cause was but it looks like water got under these concrete slabs flipped them up started again scouring away could have been really significant um i remember at the time there was someone who lived downstream who didn't want to be evacuated um and was saying it was all fuss about nothing i think if you'd have seen these photographs like you may have may have may have changed his tune now in this case there, there was some talk that maybe the spillway wasn't uh, maintained well enough so you can sort of see here various bits of plant growing through the spillway this did look a little bit ominous uh, even with the flow going down you can see there but i mean the, the investigation hasn't been completed so we'll we'll find out what quite what the issue was but again if these things go they're they're obviously dramatic one more is the Ali Dam. So this is um, near Rotherham. So in tw 2007, this had a, a, a major breach. So you can sort of see this is the M1 over here and various pumps pulling the water out. So basically, there's, there's, there's two spillways. There's the new one and then there's the masonry one down here. So the masonry one failed and started to undercut the bottom of the dam. That's obviously a big deal because if that cuts away, then that's going to underpin the whole dam. So they had to uh, start trying to pump the water out into the all into the main spillway um, but again it get, could have been serious so this has been completely changed now and they've now got a spillway down the middle of the dam so down here is an alternative so again it's it's uh well knowing how we build these things is important okay so what is that process of going about designing them so traditionally we'd have used physical scale hydraulic models or or uh fried scale physical models and these are some examples down here uh and of, this is a site which I'll talk a bit more about as we go on uh, near Skipton, where there's a site, and they, this is a one in 25 physical scale model. Nice things about physical scale models, some things you can make changes quite easily. They're quite intuitive. So if you move a sidewall, you can see what happens. Uh, you can put different flow conditions around it. So they're, they're well used and well understood by the industry. So therefore, um, they're liked. However, they are problematic in that they get taken apart as soon as the build's done. So if you want to then go and run simulations, you have to build them again. They are expensive, they're big and, and things. They also are not perfect because you have to, to do a physical scale model. You are making uh, some, that well, there are limitations, which we can talk a bit more about. So yeah, the idea of using uh, computer models to help with this is, is important, but that's also not trivial. So that's what, really what we want to talk about. Okay. Um, and that's just another example of the same physical model without the water on it. Okay, so the kind of dimensionless numbers we're interested in making a physical number are your Reynolds number, your Friday number, and your Weber number. And for open channel flows, the tens the approach you tend to take is you tend to try and match your Friday numbers. Now, obviously, you might match your Friday number at the start of your channel, but if your channel's change a section, you might not be matching it everywhere. But you, you, it, hopefully, it should be reasonable. So you match the Friday number. Um, now, unless you do uh, a, a mechanically similar, so you have an identical physical scale model to your um, pilot scale you won't have um, you won't be able to match your Reynolds number and Weber's number as well but you you basically try and choose them or choose your scale such that you get the um, hopefully the the effects of them different uh, the effects of them being different is minimal so you tend if you're in the for example if you're in a turbulent regime you try to be in a turbulent regime and there are some guidances of how small your Reynolds number can be 
for given cases and then for your Weber number which is going to if in fact basically the amount of air entrainment because the Weber number is your ratio or is related to your surface tension so obviously surface tension is going to control bubble sizes so when you make your scaling if your Weber numbers don't match you're going to have problems with uh, the amount of air entrainment so physical models tend not to be great with the amount of air entrained so when air entrainment is important so white water um, we have to be a bit cautious but again, if your model scale is not, if you haven't scaled down that much, then you, 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 you can be still OK. Um, OK, so in terms of scale effects, discrepancies between the model and the prototype due to the force ratio has been unequal. That's what we're talking about. Um, and as long as we've got approximate mechanical similitude, then our model, our physical model should be good. Um, and we try and ensure that these differences are, are small and that tech that but then there's various guidance we can do to kind of uh, to do that okay so in terms of some of the challenges so when you build when you build a, some hydraulic infrastructure they need to be resilient for say a one in a hundred year flood it won't get probably get tested for that one in a hundred year flood until it happens so then you need to know it's going to work um, it's very hard to put a one in the sort of volume of water for a one in a hundred year flood down something and test it so it, we so they really need to have a lot of confidence what we're building is going to work um, there are lots of models around so volume of fluid model there's sph approaches so which could be used for modeling but we don't yet know which models are best or most suitable for different cases so that's one of the one of one thing we, we need to look at um and then in terms of measurements well you know the these are complex flows so what do you actually measure it's quite hard to get in a spillway and measure where the free surface at lots of different locations what's the air entrainment at different locations on a spill on a on a real thing so it's 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 hard to get really good quality data sets so we need to do that and then there's uncertainty both um what models are appropriate to use where so basically industry would like to go right i want to model this let me use this piece of code and i'll do it and i get an answer out when unfortunately it's not that simple because different cases and different uh, different situations require different modeling assumptions and it's very hard to give guidance of what works where so trying to build guidance is 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 kind of an important step okay and then we've got so i've talked a bit about air entrainment so air entrainment is challenging and it's both challenging um, on for physical scale models because as we said actually matching the Weber numbers for your physical scale and your full scale model is not not easy um, so therefore you get um, errors but also in your CFD models it's difficult because in a CFD model um, you have to well the air entrainment process is, is, a, is another level of complexity into the physics which you have to include which makes things which makes things more challenging um, and then there's also some issues that people have a lot of confidence in physical scale models because they've been used a lot so they kind of say well oh, it's not so the, your computer models are not as good as your physical scale models but there are limitations to physical scale models as well so you need to be able to work out where the two maybe can be used together and use you know put some work to, to help a physical scale and a, mo a computer model to be able to um, to, to maybe uh, replace the disadvantages with one with the other okay so just a couple of quick videos to sort of thing well what might a cfd model chuck out the other end um so these are some models done in flow 3d um which is just a one cfd code particularly done for free surface flows and you've got flow coming out of a spillway and you've got another the second one is just flow um coming through a, a bridge and you're getting it backing up so the real question is these look nice and it looks like the flow is all good is it right you know are, 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 is it is it overtopping in the right places um is the way the, the you know the, the the depths are they going to be correct are the pressures on the bed going to be correct so it's not just a case of it or if it looks pretty that might sell it to a client but if it's not correct then that's that's kind of potentially dangerous so it's about understanding when it's correct so what are our methods we've got well so the most common cfd method is the volume of fluid method that's a, a, a approach for resolving a free surface so typically that will there'll be a volume of fluid method uh, approach within most cfd codes we've got um, particle based methods like sph which is a lagrangian approach which is quite a lot of promise for um for modeling hydraulic flows where the three surfaces but it's not as well developed so um and not as well validated for cases but it's interesting and then we've got Eulerian Eulerian approaches where you don't explicitly resolve a free surface but potentially has got use for where you've got lots of air entrainment because you model both the air and water phases separately um, and and we've well, I'll show you a bit of work where it's got some some good potential 
Right. So, um, in terms of, uh, so I'm going to we're going to look at some physical, uh, some um, some modelling we've done against, uh, and then which we've been able to validate against some experimental data. So experimental data comes from this step spillway rig in. Uh, Lisbon with uh, some colleagues we worked with there and this is a really nice piece of facility because basically we can it's, it's large enough to kind of be approximate um, something uh, you get all the physical characteristics happening um, now if I just talk about the sort of flow you get on a step spillway so you can see this sort of figure here you'll have this almost laminar flow coming over the top which is this you get this clear surface and then we said at some point you'll get an inception point at the inception point that's where air starts getting entrained into the flow and you get your white water so uh, that's sort of happening around here on this one or around here you also get a bulking of the flow because as the air gets pulled in your volume increases so you get a, 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 a volume increase now where that inception point happens is where you've got a turbulent boundary layer which detaches and then where that comes in contact or gets close to the free surface, that seems to be the point at which the air gets entrained. That's still kind of quite an active research area to, to exactly why the air gets entrained, but that, that, that's the general idea. Okay, so um, there's various experimental data we can get. We can get the, the, the free surface height. We can get, um, we've got a back flushing pitot tube, so we can get the velocities of the flow and these can move around in different locations. And then we've got a conductivity probe. The conductivity probe can tell us the air volume fraction so that can be moved down within the flow at various locations um, in quite a time consuming way to pick up what the air volume fraction is so that's all really nice data then to compare with our cfd models so okay so i'll talk about, about some work that jacob had done on this so um the sort of yeah so just talk oh sorry before i do that a little bit more about the sort of flow you will get so you'd expect in each step cavity you'll get these recirculating vortices shown here as well and those vortices are going to affect the pressures on the step that's important because that could result in either plucking of masonry um, steps away or potential if you get low pressures cavitation happening so you know knowing the sort of pressures you're getting accepts is, is critical for the sort of the, the design engineers um, so that becomes important um, we talked about the inception point already so we've got these various the various regions okay so just to give you a snapshot of what you can expect from different models before we go into modeling that um, the, the Lisbon spillway. This is a spillway we've got in the basement in civil engineering. So it's a bit simpler. It's got 80 centimeter length steps and you can see there's a inception point happening here. And just to give you an idea of the sort of difference you'd see in between a VOF model and an Eulerian model, uh, you can see here. So VOF model, you get nice smooth surface at the top which is actually well predicted, but then you don't get any inception point. It stays a very controlled free surface because that's what the Voff method, method is trying to achieve. Whereas when we run the Eulerian Eulerian method, we can sort of see air getting entrained, which is more like what we see in reality. So we'd seen some, some qualitatively good results from what we've seen here. So we want to then verify, well, are they actually doing what they should be? Is it, is, is it, is this just, does this just look pretty or is it actually entraining air in, in a way which is, which is meaningful? And also, are we able to predict where the inception point is? Because that's a key thing, again, for the engineers. Where does the inception point start? So we'll look a bit at that. Okay, just talking about the Eulerian-Eulerian Eulerian multiphase model a second. So we solve for both two phases. So, um, so we'll solve the momentum and cont continuity equations for both phases. So we can think of our K can be either one or two for water or air. So every term in our equations has obviously got a volume fraction in there. So our volume fraction, if it's one, then it will be all water. If it's zero, it will be all air. Um, so and, and but every so for every every cell, we we solve for both both phases. And then perhaps the key, well, a key term is this m, uh, which basically represents the phase interactions between the two things. So if you think about it, you've got this water and air going between each other. It's how uh, the forces of go between those two phases which is important and that there's obviously going to be a drag effect and that's going to be dependent on the bubble sizes so there's some models which are included to take that into account um, as well okay so this is this is what um some some of jacob's work so now we're, now we're looking at we're trying to say did the oil could the oil area and area model uh predict these the the the, the sorts of flow we're seeing on the spillway because no one had really shown that could be done before so that's something we've been working on 
So this is a geometry and it's basically, it's got a lot of steps, so it's a big geometry. So we started off with 2D simulations um, and this is your mesh. So even in 2D to get mesh independence, which is obviously the important part of doing any CFD model, you're still talking over a quarter of a million cells. And because it's a multi-phase model, that tends to be quite computational. So these take a fair amount of time to run still. Um, we're using a RANS approach. So um, Reynolds Average, Navier Stokes. Um, and um, uh, is there anything else I want to say? And, oh yeah, and they're transient simulations. So we're running these transiently until they reach, well, either they reach a steady state because, or pseudo steady state, or we can get an average. And typically they do reach a steady state in these cases. Right. So what do we compare that to? So, well, I've mentioned the inception point. So inception point is uh, is this point where we start getting our increase in bulking of the flow and the air starting to coming in. So experimentally, how do people measure that? And there's two key ways they, they look at that. So I put called these IP1 and IP2. So one where one method is you look at where the, the turbulent boundary layer, which is what we said is it detaches from the top here and that makes its way towards the free surface where that inter, inter, intersects with the equivalent clear water depth. So this equivalent clear water depth, just to imagine what that is, is obviously we've got air in our flow. So and we're measuring that with a constant with the, our conductivity probe. So we know at each at a given point through the depth what the what the how much air is in there. So if you then took out the air and thought, well, what would be the depth of the water without that air in it? at that given point, that's what the equivalent clear water depth is. So you can you can work that out as long as you've got the data. So you can plot that and where the turbulent boundary layer interacts with that, that's one definition of where the inception point is. The second one is a bit more visual and it basically says we look for where we can see bubbles in the flow. OK, so it, or where we see air starting to form. And I've got some results for this particular spillway. I've lost someone, they've gone home. <laughs> Sorry, I just turned the door. Does someone want to just, do you want to just, do you want to just um, pop your mic off, whoever that is? Is that all right? Thanks. Okay, so we've got um, uh, four different flow rates. Um, which we've tested on the experiment spillway. And just to give you an idea, so these two methods, IP1 and IP2, they give reasonably similar. So uh, this was showing it on step 14, but IP2 was showing it on step 15. Uh, then we've got 16 and 17. This one was 18 and 20. So the IP2, this one where we visually look for white water in the flow and then use that, that tends to predict the inception point a bit downstream. So you get, in effect, you get a window between, you, you don't know exactly which step it is, but it tends to be uh, in, a, in a range. So that's useful for, because we really wanted to know is with our kind of computer models actually identify where this is. So this is what we've got to kind of compare to. So we'll, 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 we'll come back to these. So you'll see IP1 and IP2 later. Okay, so this is sort of the model results. So we did a comparison. So we did our, our VOF model, which again, doesn't predict the free surface, but it's useful because uh, it's to compare against. And then this is our Eulerian model. So already it's looking good because it looks like we've uh, been able to um, get some air. So, these, so this is the air concentration. So we are seeing some bulking of the flow and air going in. What we want to know is, is, is the amount of air which is being entrained realistic or correct? Now, one thing to note is you do seem to get too much air getting entrained higher up the spillway. So the inception point is probably on this about here. So there is some artificial air going in up here, whereas actually, so the VOF model is actually looking a bit better early on, but then is not having air entrained, whereas the Eulerian learning is getting some artificial air get, coming in a bit or too early, um, which which um, is, is, well, is a, a disadvantage. Right, so, but actually the results are pretty good. So, so when we get down, when we sort of move downstream of the spillway, so we've got step 11 onwards. So basically these are our steps as we go down. So, uh, so one at the top and then moving down two, three, four, et cetera. Um, so what we're, what we're looking at is three different results from three different turbulence models. So two K epsilon models and the K omega SST model. And I'll just give you a hint now, the KMST model generally works better across the way. So in a way, we're just, so look out for the, the yellow one, that tends to be better. So early on, they're all fairly similar. The, 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 the squares, this is, sorry, just to be clear, this is the depth through the, um, 
going up through the uh, water depth. And then this is our velocity on that on this axis, just to be clear. So we can see so um, pretty good all the way along. All the models doing fairly well initially. And then by the time we get to the later steps, it's actually the, the KM aggressors T, the yellow line, which is following the experiments. And the other two drift away a little bit. OK, but none of them are terrible, but definitely the KM aggressors T is better. And we see the similar results across all the different flows, all, all four different flow rates. Um, so that, yeah, so that that's looking positive for the KM aggressors T model. Now, we just added in. Um, the standard K omega and the standard K epsilon model. So the reason I've done that is so I'll just go back. So this is without. Now, the K omega T model is a combination of the K epsilon model in the main body of the flow, and it's the K omega model at the walls. So I don't know if you're aware, but that, that's that's how it works. So it was just interesting to see whether the K omega, what, what, well, what was, why was the K omega T doing something different? And what actually happens is we see that the K omega model and the K omega T, the yellow and the green, are very strongly in agreement and then all of the k epsilon models are all in agreement to so this one this one and this one which are these ones here so that's telling us probably that it's the flow near the wall which is determining the difference because that's where the k omega and the k omega sst models are the same whereas once you go into the main body of the flow the k omega sst becomes the k epsilon model and at that point the flow will be the same okay now, just looking a bit more closely, this is just um, a graph. This is now with the KM Aggressors T model, the results for velocity. We've just shown, um, so we've got our four different velocities, or sorry, four different flow rates rather. And this is the uh, depth away from the steps. This is, uh, so this is at the, this is at the pseudo bottom. So just, I haven't really said this, but the pseudo bottom is that line which goes along there of your spillway. So the ones here are very close to that pseudo bottom. And the reason I'm pointing that is that's where the biggest error is. So the errors tend to be small, except for this, this very close to the pseudo bottom. And that's fairly representative across all of them. It's that one. So we were like, oh, why is our model not working well very close to the pseudo bottom? And that seemed a bit counterintuitive. It was good everywhere, but it wasn't, it wasn't good really close to the pseudo bottom. Um, now, we don't fully know, but if I just show you the flow field, it could be that it's actually experimental. Um, problem. So let's just have a look why I say that. So this is the flow field in one step. So the you can imagine it's these lines that we're measuring the velocities on. And as I said, so we're measuring with a pitot tube. So it's a back flushing pitot tube. So you can sort of see here, this is the one where we start getting the worst results. And you can sort of see that the flow in a pitot tube should be perpendicular to it. So it faced, the pitot tube faces in a direction, you need the flow coming out it, at it head on. And you can sort of see some of the velocity vectors are looking slightly not very head on there. So it's likely that this could be where there's, there's the biggest experimental uncertainty. Um, and that might be why we're seeing the worst results there. We don't know that definitively, but it, that's that's the hypothesis we're trying to we're trying to check. So, so generally, I think the model's good, and I guess that's my take-home point. Um, so the other thing, obviously, we're interested in is, is the air. I've talked about air concentrations. The velocities are good, but what are the air concentrations like? This is particularly what the Eulerian Eulerian model, why we were using it, and again. Generally, they are very good. So again, we've got the three models, and the KM T model is the best again. So this is the this is the um, amount. Um, so this is the air volume fraction or air concentration on this axis. This is the depth again, and you can see pretty good agreement across the way at all at all through the different steps, or at least the best agreement with the element. Now, if, if we were showing a VOF model, that would be a binary binary case of going, there's, there's no air, there's full, full air. So it would almost look, so the VOF model would look something like that. Okay, so this, so it is, it seems to be very well predicting that. So we're very pleased with that. And that's the case across all the different flow rates. So it's, so it certainly seems to do doing what it should do. Um, I've just added in those other two models, the KMGR and the KMGRS model, uh, just to show that we see the same trend. So you can see the yellow and green lines. So the KMGR and the KMGR SST are both following the same trend, and all the KEPSIL, three KEPSIL models are following trend. So that's exactly the same trend that we saw with the velocities um, that we saw. And I just put this in as a little bit of a tangent. So this is just looking at a single step. So this is these three. K epsilon models 
um, and I would say they're, they're nigh on identical. This is looking at the turbulent kinetic energy. Um, and you can see the key thing is that this recirculation zone is the same pretty much in all three. And then, whereas in your K-omega and your K-omega SST models, this recirculator is bigger, which is meaning that you're getting less turbulent kinetic energy here because you're getting less flow colliding with the step effectively. Um, so again, it's just useful to compare the results of the different turbulence models because we don't really know what's the most, most appropriate turbulence models to use. But I think if we look at the results from the different ones, we can actually then do some comparisons and it's useful to see why they're giving different results. Um, and, a, and a further point there is the turbulent kinetic energy is actually highly correlated to the amount of mixing you get. So that will also be quite important for how much air is getting entrained. So if we're not predicting the turbulent kinetic energy right, that's likely to have a knock on effect to not doing the air entrainment correct as well. Uh, so the free surfaces, so this is just um, the depths of the flows and just don't want to talk about this too much, just say, yeah, generally we see the same trend, the KMX ST model does it pretty well. Um, we can look at the Y90, which is basically where your local air con concentration is 0.9, because obviously there's air in this, so where where is the top of the flow? Well, by definition, we just say where, where you've got, where it's 90%, um, uh, where, where the air concentration is 90, below, below 90%. Um, and yeah, so just showing it. So we can also put the clear water depth on. So remember we said the equivalent clear water depth. This is where if you squashed out all of the air, what the depth of the water would be. And we can compare the, the black dots, the experimental values of that. And again, the yellow one is the KMO Ghost ST, which again, you can see is the closest. So it, it it's, you know, it reinforces what we said. If, you know, the velocity is correct, the air concentrations are correct. I guess you'd you'd naturally think hopefully the depths are going to be correct as well, and that does that does come come through. Now I've talked a bit about predicting where the inception points happen. So there, there was these two experimental approaches we talked about, about for generating inception points. Um, so the inception points are marked on here. The, the experimentally found one with the two different methods, so IP one and IP two. Um, and if you remember, one of the methods was based on where the turbulent boundary layer started to cut close to the free the free surface, or the um, or, or where the um, clear water depth um, would would indicate the free surface was. And this is really what this is just trying to show. So this is basically a turbulent boundary layer coming up, and where so where these lines are coming together in each case would be where our model is approximating the uh, inception point would be. So in each case, you can see actually it's probably quite a good measure from you from the CFD is actually giving you a good measure where the inception point is. So it, potentially it's quite a good tool for working out where it is, uh, or at least as good as the, you know, we said that the, there's two different experiments would give you a band, um, but it seems to be giving you something in the right place. The other place, the other way of looking at inspection points was to, to visually see where air had started to come into the domain. So in this case, we're looking at where this light blue is and you can see well it appears between our two ones in this case again it appears in the right place here and it, okay. so in each case the actual just the visual equivalent inspection method so just looking at where the air has started to become entrained seems a reasonable way of doing it as well but yeah we'd have to put a metric on well what is it how much would you be looking at in terms of the contours Okay, so I've gone on a bit about um, steps for hallways, but um, and using this oil or air or layering and layering approach. The reason I'm kind of saying that is because that this is a method which is not typically used, but actually potent, has quite a lot of potential, and that seems to be the case. So it's 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 where you've got this um, air entrainment and complex complex flows. It's 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 a, a useful approach. Um, so that's just really summarising what we found. So the Cambridge ST model seems to be the most uh, of, of the RANS approaches seems to be the best suited. Um, we've got a promising way to identify where the inception points are going to be. Uh, shown that the oil layering, layering model has some potential. Um, it does need further investigation of this is a fairly simple geometry. Um, we have tested it with different flow rates, but again, if you start, you know, real spillways tend to have more complicated geometries. Would the model work well for those? Um, what would happen in diff different cases? So it, it needs more work to become, to be able to say, well, actually yeah, recommending people should be using this routinely, but it definitely looks like it's, it's a method we should be looking at more and it, it currently isn't used at all in industry. Okay, so to keep on the, 
uh, so now we're, so those that was a 2D study. Now I want to look, look at some of the 3D effects which come about. So if I just show you this little video for a second, um, we've got here. So you actually get some quite compli more complicated structures in your step cavities. So you can see here this dye being injected and you're getting flow kind of going this way and this way. And you basically see on every other step, you get these sort of flows. So if I just show, so you basically on, on odd number steps, in this case, the flow is going this way around. On the next step, it will be going uh, the other way around. And that will that will keep happening every other step. And we weren't expecting to see that. That, that We saw that first on our, um, our our own rig in the lab. And then subsequently, we've, we've seen it on the Lisbon, the larger scale um, lab as well. And the first question is, well, will our models predict this? Because um, if this is a real physical phenomenon, it's actually going to change the pressures on the stops. And we've, we've taken measurements to show that it does. If your model's not predicting this, it's, it's, it, that could be problematic. And also, how much does it affect things? So. The reassuring thing was the models do predict it, both FOF models and the Eulerian models predict it. And you can see uh, the result is you get this pressure on the middle of the step, then the outside of the step every other as you go down. And that's on both. Now, on the Eulerian model, you'll notice further down, you get them less, less, uh, the pressures are smaller. And that's because you've got the bulking effect of the air getting drawn into the flow, which actually reduces the pressure on the steps. So, again, that's another reason for. Uh, why the Eulerian model is is further down is 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 giving something better than the Voth model. Um, these are just some streamlines of what's happening in the steps. So you get this kind of structure coming to the outside, then it comes back in again, and then that continues to repeat all the way down the steps. And that's what creates this 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 what we saw with these 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 structures swirling around. And then you might have a question: Well, what happens if you make your step wider? Do these structures just get squashed or spread out, or or what will happen? Um, and this is where I'm going to ask you a question in the chat just to see if you're paying attention. So in the chat, tell me what you think is going to happen when we double the width of this structure. So you've doubled that. So whatever size that is, you're going to double it. How, what's going to happen to these structures? If no one answers, I'll assume you'll all asleep. What's going to happen? So we've got two swirling structures like this. Double the width of your spillway, what happens? So rows going to be wider. So do you mean that this structural, so they'll be sort of like, this is a very bad drawing. And then that, that kind of that kind of wider, or do you mean something else? Um, yeah, oh. no, that was kind of what I meant. OK. Uh, Yatin saying the swirls will double in size. So as in stretch, so, so do you think the pressure profile will look similar on the steps? Yeah, so the same thing happens with the pressure, just how the swirls are kind of bigger. So like how you've got there, like that one half will be one swirl and the other half will be another swirl. Okay, okay. Anyone think anything different? All right, I'll, I'll keep you from uh, I'll get, guessing. So actually what happens, oh, I, I, I misread my next slide. Okay, I'll tell you what happens in a second. Sorry, I forgot I had this slide here. So just, just all I want to say on this one is that we've taken, we experimentally have got um, pressure sensors and put them on the steps, and um, that allowed us to show that our experimental results, the pressures were forming in the same place. So you can see here, you get a high pressure zone on a even step, and then on an odd step, it's in the middle. So it, it, it the, our experiments were. We're showing the same result. That's that's what I'm saying, and it's the same on the back face of the step where we took pressure measurements as well. Okay, so then to answer my the, the question we we're talking about, so what happens when you double them? Actually, the interesting thing was the structures. Uh, um, uh, what do we call it? Uh, you could get more of them. So rather than so they will as you make a little bit wider, they'll stretch. But after a certain point, you get new ones popping out. And then actually, if I keep if I keep making it wider, they keep popping out, and you get more and more of them. Which we were quite interested by because that we hadn't expected to see them, and then we suddenly saw that the model was predicting what was happening in reality, and we're like, oh, that's quite interesting. So it begs the question because there's a couple of interesting things. So if you change the flow rate, it doesn't actually change where the structures form. So we we had four different flow rates in our case. In each case, the structures appear in the same places. Obviously, the pressures and things change, but you still get the same. They don't that didn't change very much. Um, but 
if we make the split so spillway, the way way we actually experimentally looked at that is we made little infills for our spillway so we could like change the ratio of our steps and when we did that we saw that this this result did happen um which then asked the question that begged the question well what is controlling the how would you predict how many of you these to get so if you know your size of your step um and maybe so in this case the step ratio is equal but if the step ratio wasn't equal how many of these would you get um and we started looking so we started making wider spillways and i said this is the uh lisbon spillway and you can see here they put in little pieces of string to sort of see to try and find where these were so they would they realized that they were identifying these as well um but it still wasn't completely c clear to us how how many you would get in a given spillway but doing some models uh so this is number of pairs of structures so basically one two three four etc and this is the width over height ratio so width and height um and you can see they all do seem to be falling onto this onto this line now um we have a <laughs> we're still we're still working on what this might be because it, you know if it's not if it doesn't change with flow rate you would think that it had to be a function of the step geometry um and we're still well <laughs> we're having to make the model but we're still working on exactly what that is we, obviously we know what the equation of that straight line is but connecting that straight line so that it, it so we have a relationship which is uh is independent each geometry is something we're still still working on but it's it's interesting it's it's a all of our different models so the, well i'll show you some results here but every model we've done it in we get these structures formed so they clearly happen we're seeing on the experiments so that we're quite interested in in being able to predict these um and, and or understand fundamentally what is controlling the ratio of these these spaces because yeah that's it, it's not something straightforward like i don't know the square root of the the height or anything like that it's it's it, it, it we're not quite sure but if anyone can work that out for me, I'll be very pleased. Right, so, um, so I've just asked the question here, are the results observed in other solvers? And I think I may have just answered that question. Uh, the answer is these structures are definitely formed. So this, we ran it in open foam as well as those previous ones were in Fluent. Um, and yeah, get the same structures, almost identical. So yeah, they, they and we see them both in the VOF models and the Eulerian Eulerian models. So they're clearly fundamentally there um but yeah that does that that has not helped us work out quite what is controlling how many you get the thing which open foam didn't predict was the air entrainment so when we use so the voff model very similar results to uh the fluent but when we use the eulerian eulerian model in open foam which we vote we haven't done as much work on so far so this may just be um due to implementation but we are not seeing the uh, air entrainment like we do in fluent so um the, the result is much closer to what you see in the voff model so that's got us thinking now what is it we're doing differently in the in the fluent implementation and the and the layer and i mentioned the um the the interact the the phase interact uh, interaction terms that m in the, our equations obviously we're trying to look closely at how we're considering both of those um because um uh, currently we, we can't get open foam to the Eulerian Eulerian model in open foam to respond in the same way as it does in fluent so um there's still some questions to be better understood there and that before we could use it reliably um i mentioned earlier so this is the turbulent, turbulent kinetic energy plots in fluent so just say if you remember we said that you expect to get the air entrainment once the turbulent boundary layer has met with the free surface or got close to the free surface so this, i'll just show the same plot but i'm just going to change the scale so this is um four times 10 to the minus one if i just make that so basically what that's showing is so this is your turbulent connection so you can sort of effectively see this is your boundary layer moving up as we said and when that's getting close you can sort of see that's experimentally where the inception point was so you can see that um if you don't predict your turbulent kinetic energy correctly that's you're not going to um that, that's the thing which is effectively con uh, having a strong correlation with how much air is drawn into the model so if you're not predicting that correctly you're not going to get it and and that is the case when you look at your open foam model the turbulent kinetic energy is different so there's some things still to look at there for us to to really know how this can be used okay now i'm just gonna 
I'm kind of getting short time, so I'm going to very quickly skip through this. But I just wanted to give you a sense of a of another example where um, of a spillway, but where um, the air entrainment is less of a or, or where where not including air the air entrained is, is is still can give you some good results, but it's in a case where the air entrainment is less impactful than the actual spillway. So this is um, a case study up in Skipton, and it's a, it's this has now been constructed, and I'll show you some photos. It's a, a spillway as part of a flood alleviation scheme, and effectively the flood alleviation scheme has got a golf course over here, and the plan is that this golf this is there's a dam being built across this this um, river goes through here and you can basically control the flow going in this direction so you can close off this flow going here that could then flood this big reservoir up here behind um, so that basically you protect downstream so you protect this way but they'll get to a point when if, if you if the rain kept on coming you would fill this whole dam you don't want to overtop the dam so then they've built this um, spillway here where basically this would be if in, in, in an emergency you would put the flow down so you're kind of hoping they're hoping this won't ever really have to be used or it'll only be used in a really extreme situation after this golf course has been flooded um, but obviously it needs to work when it does come to be used so this this is what we designed designed with physical scale models and it's what we've then subsequently gone and used cfd models for to, to do so i'll show you that that briefly now okay so just a few photos so this is the dam top across here uh, this is the spillway it's got this labyrinth weir at the top um, this is just some plans. So again, you can sort of see the spillway down here. I'll just rotate this so you can sort of see. So there's our spillway. The culvert is going through there. So that's just matching it all up. So the bit which is going to be flooded is all of this. And then when it get, if it did rather than overtopping, you want the flow to go down here. So again, this is now in operation, but again, no water has ever gone down this spillway because to get water down the spillway, you have to flood the golf course. No one wants to flood a golf course just for the sake of it to test the spillway. So they need to be super confident that this is going to take the flow, um, which is which is going to happen. So, so one of the quotes, so I guess the questions the company, so this is with, it was with Arup, they were interested in is could this labyrinth weir and spillway have safely been designed using computational modeling? Um, and a second question we had was can the modeling be better and understand the scale effects with the physical scale models? Um, so those, those are two questions we were trying to answer. And again, very quickly, just because you know, to, to talk, not got much time, is this is one in 25 physical scale models. So all our parameters get scaled based on um, we match our fraud numbers and then we we scale. Um, they took various measurements. So, for example, they marked out where these wave structures were. They had various points where they took the depths and velocities. They again ran at four different flow, uh, flow rates. Uh, so we've got those data sets. We ran both in fluent and open foam, and we were trying to match as closely as we could together. Um, one, one, anyone who's done any VOF modeling in open foam and fluent. So, you um, in fluent, we ran both. Uh, well, so in open foam, you can only run a compressive interface scheme. So this is the scheme to capture the interface. In Fluent, you've got the combination. You can use uh, both geometric and compressive schemes. So we ran both. And actually, the Fluent geometric and compressive schemes gave very, very, fairly similar results or very similar results. Um, so we actually implemented the geometric scheme. But whereas in open foam, it's a mules, which is the, which is a compressive scheme for the interface. So that, those are the those are the main differences um, when we're in between the two solves. Everything else we tried to match as close as we could. Um, OK, so just say so our approach was basically to model the physical scale model. So if, if do the CFT of the physical scale, see how well, how good it is. So that would tell us something. Um, if it is good, then use that, to then scale up your CFD to full size and then see, are there any effects which we see, which the physical scale model might not have picked up? Um, okay, so because of time, I'm gonna very quickly. So the, the story of the, the, um, the modeling the physical scale is basically that it does it reasonably well or pretty well. So we looked at the 14 QMEX and you can see that these wave structures are fairly well predicted. So you can sort of see them here um, as we get. So they were predicted and then various uh, this velocities were well predicted in both fluent and open foam. And then as we went through 
um, at the different flow rates. Again, reasonably good, good, good agreement. At the highest flow rate, there was some one of the points wasn't quite well predicted, but gen generally, generally we were pretty happy that we could predict what was happening in the physical scale. But then we could say, okay, well, let's now see when we make we now scale up our CFD to full size and then see if there's any differences. And what you'd expect or what you'd hope for is that these would be minimal because that's the point of the physical scale model. And generally, our velocities and depths were fairly well predicted at the, at the lowest flow rates, which actually where the limits on the on the scale factors were being pushed the most. So actually the 40 QMEX was probably breaking some of the guidance around the scaling laws. We did see some difference between our depths and our velocities. Um, so you can sort of see here, you know, it, um, th they they weren't identical. So that that was that was worth that was interesting to see, and that was kind of as expected because we were breaking some of the um, the, the, the 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 scaling rules. But the, what you'd expect is that's less risky because these are small flow rates. These are, tend to be the safer. It's when you go to the high flow rates, the more extreme conditions, where you're going to get the problems, and Although our depths and velocities were better predicted in these cases, the waves, these wave structures we've mentioned started moving a bit. And you can kind of get an idea of that from these, these are the, the, the difference between the scaled and the physical scaled. And because they move, that that's becomes important because actually you don't want um, the wave that could mean you got your if you were designing with this in mind, you could have something overtopping in the wrong place. So this is quite an interesting result. So we're now trying to understand quite why. The, um, the wave structures are, are getting, um, are, are moving, or why the physical scale model isn't. So we're doing, extending that out. But that's that's quite an interesting observation that in the big flow rates, although the generally the depths and velocities were well predicted, actually some of the, these key wave structures, which are important, are actually changing, um, and that could have that could have quite significant consequences in some cases. Okay, so I'm going to skip through this because. We've got short of time, but I just just to say, if um, I've there is a project going to be available on this um, because it, it is an area where there's quite a lot more work to look at. So both on the air entrainment, how that's best dealt with, but also on the sort of flow you get over various different structures. So we've seen um, a labyrinth weir there. We also get piano key weirs. So all of these need. Um, careful consideration. So we're working with people like Mott McDonald to try and they've got data sets from the physical scale models. So trying to work together to try and uh, get better guidance of what 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 which models are appropriate where. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to rush that through to the end just because I've got to gone on a little bit. But um, just to give you a chance in case you do want to ask any questions. So we'll finish finish there, but more than happy if you've got any questions to try and answer them.